Oh, yeah. Well, yes. Thank you guys so much for not only attending the art show, but for our first live taping of Out of Bounds. Yes. Um, we are very sad that Amy couldn't be here. And obviously, like all the tornado, anyone affected, um, we feel horrible for them and we just hope everyone's okay but we do have miss sean johnson an olympic gold medalist so Yay! she's thank you. hello thanks for having me <laughs> thank you for being here of course yes. okay so jamie and i met you at a game yes a few weeks ago i guess yes and your husband is amazing he's <laughs> like you. the most he's he an walks. energizer bunny he, he is, is. <laughs> yeah he's like the ultimate hype man he really and is he like can't turn it down yeah yeah he like made me feel amazing I mean, he's like oh my god i love your jacket where'd you get it da, 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 yeah. da. and i was like <laughs> yeah. hello who are you yes. okay where did you guys meet where do we meet oh my gosh long story try to summarize it so i went to the 2012 olympics to work so it was this olympics after mine and I went to a USA track cycling event. So think Lance Armstrong, but on like a track and field track, pretty much. It's strange. Um, and I met one of the USA athletes. His name was Guy East. And we got to like talking. I was interviewing him for a show. And at the end of it, he said, you have to meet my younger brother. I think you guys would be perfect for each other. And I was like, you're ridiculous. <laughs> I, this is weird and awkward. Um, <laughs> Fast forward like a few months, I, we were back in the United States and he and his younger brother, my, now my husband, um, flew out for a blind date and no we went on a blind date. How old were y'all? I, I was 20 and he was 21. Wow. So y'all yeah. were babies. We were babies. I was 19 when I met John. So yeah. it's, yeah, he was 24, I think. Yeah. We were babies. But two, two babies later, it worked out. Yeah. The blind date worked out. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Y'all are so cute. How old are the <laughs> kids you. now? Uh, my daughter is two. She just turned two. And our my son, our daughter, our son, um, <laughs> is four months. So, oh, yes. yeah. Chunks. He, yeah. <laughs> my my son is little Hulk man. He is huge. <laughs> and so is my daughter. But they adorable. are absolutely precious. Thank you. Yes, they are. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. That's fun. Okay, we, we have to get into the gymnast Great. side of things. <laughs> yes. I have so many questions about just what that was like, what age you started, mm. how many hours you trained. I mean, I know you're not doing it anymore, but I'm yeah. so interested no. in it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm long since retired. <laughs> um, so I started gymnastics when I was, I think, like two years old. So it was however old you have to be to do like mommy and me classes. Uh, essentially the same time you would start kids in like a swim lesson mm -hmm. or a ballet class, I started gymnastics. And my parents put me in it because I was a, a crazy toddler who ended up in the ER every other two weeks because I believed I legitimately could fly. Oh um, <laughs> so I, like, jumped off of the stair banisters and off of tables, and, like, it was bad. Wow. Okay. I probably should have seen a psychiatrist. Is but, Drew yeah. like that? I see her yeah. being like that. She yeah. is. She gives me a heart attack. She but does. But, yeah, she is like that. <laughs> so my parents put me in what they called a padded playground. And, yeah, scary. And I found the trampoline, which further convinced mm. myself that I could fly. Um, so I fell in love with the sport. And I did so many other sports too growing up. I ran track, I played soccer, I tried softball, basketball, which is a joke. Um, <laughs> I danced, I swam, I did literally everything. And just through the years as they progressed and got more serious, I kind of mm. had to weed things out just for time. And gymnastics is what stuck. By the time I was on like the Olympic year, Olympic level, I was training probably 30 hours a week, but I attended public school at the same time. Uh -huh. Oh, you did? So, so you I still did. went to school? I did. So what age do they say, okay, you have the potential to be like in the Olympics? Um, a coach or myself? Well, <laughs> both. Um, a coach will probably feed a lot of not truth to you. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people try to say that you can tell at a very young age if someone has talent. And I, I do believe that. I do mm -hmm. believe I can see little kids and I'm like, oh, they're very talented in gymnastics, but there's so much more that goes into it. It has to be, you know, a passion. It has to be something that they stick with. There's a lot of luck involved. They have to get, like, they have to stay healthy and not get hurt. It's mm -hmm. just like, there's so many things. So my coach at the time that I was going to, he told my parents, like, she's very good at gymnastics. Mm -hmm. 
but I also just loved it. And mm -hmm. so I think year after year I kind of progressed and um, made it, but I think it's a lot of like worlds have to align for yeah. it to happen. Mm -hmm. Like uh, we were talking about this earlier and it's amazing. Like you, you see kids saying, I want to be in the NFL. Mm -hmm. I want to be mm -hmm. Olympian. Um, did it ever feel far-fetched for you oh or was gosh. it just something that you were like, I'm, I'm going to do this? I, so I was that kid where like you would see on questionnaires that you write in school, what do you want to be when you grow up? And yeah. I was like, I, I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> I was a sophisticated <laughs> child. Um, and I wanted to be an Olympic gymnast. Oh, and wow. so I was definitely that kid that had like that aspiration, but yeah. I never in a million years thought that was possible yeah. it was always like the dream yeah it was like being cinderella or something mm -hmm. and i even remember my coach asking me like what did i want to do within the sport and i said i wanted to go to the olympics and year after year it was still just like a pinch me moment i would mm -hmm. i continually progressed year after year and made it to a different level and kind of kept climbing that ladder and i still remember being at world championships being selected for the olympic team and I, like, laughed. I was like, what are you talking about? This oh. is an absolute joke. I'm standing next to Nastia Lukin, yeah. who, like, I had beat at the time. And y'all are y'all are still, like, oh, best yeah. friends, We're best right? friends. Yeah. But I remember the first time I, like, beat her. Uh -huh. And I was almost like, this is your medal. I don't know what I'm doing with it. <laughs> <laughs> this is weird. Um, so it, it felt impossible all the way up until I was competing. It yeah. still didn't seem real. Mm -hmm. How old were you at that point? I was 16. Whoa. I was a baby. I didn't realize you were that young. Yeah. So now, were you still going to public school at that point? I was. Jeez. So it was another very long story I could um, not bore you with, but I think it's pretty fascinating for like three hours. My coach is Chinese, and he moved from China, from being um, a world and Olympic gymnast in China, to the United States with um, the American dream of starting a gymnastics gym and raising Olympians mm -hmm. that were also able to have a social life and be children. Mm. Um, being a Chinese athlete, he kind of had his whole life taken from him. Mm -hmm. He wasn't allowed to live with his parents. He never got to play in a playground. Oh, wow. So many different things. And his dream was to raise these gymnasts, these successful gymnasts who also got to go to public school, to got, that got to have birthday parties and um, skip gymnastics practice to go to school dances and so I truly got to be able to be a kid and I think oh. it's because of that that I was so successful yeah because I was able to enjoy it a lot more so what was your training like if it was 30 hours so you wake up in the morning and the like traditional stereotypical Olympic gymnast kind of regimen would be to train nine hours a day and do mm -hmm. private school at the gym so you would wake up and basically go to the gym train four hours do school and train five more hours um, for me, with my coach's like different um, technique, he I would wake up and I would go to a full day of public school. And as soon as public school was out, I would go straight to the gym and I did four hours every night. I did mm -hmm. Monday to Friday and then I did five mm -hmm. or six hours on Saturday. Mm -hmm. And he had a very strict rule that there was you weren't allowed to do anything active on Sunday. You had to like rest and sleep mm -hmm. and go to the movie theaters and go shopping and eat ice cream. That's and great. He'd be like, did you have pancakes or waffles? And I'm like, <laughs> I had pancakes. He's like, great. Oh, so, that's amazing. He was, he was an incredible coach. That's awesome. Wow. Well, with that being said, about the pancakes and the waffles, yes. <laughs> did you have to be on a strict diet? And um, mm -hmm. uh, how hard was that being six years old, 16 years old? Um, yes and no. So I was never required to be on a strict diet with my coach. Mm -hmm. Everything changed when I made the USA national team because after you make the national team, you then go under observation basically of the United States coaches. Mm -hmm. And it, it gets very um, confusing and political back then mm -hmm. because my coach was still technically my coach, but the Carolis oversaw mm -hmm. my coach. Mm -hmm. And things were so political back then to where... I could still do my own thing, but if I didn't kind of skew it in the way that they wanted, uh -huh. the political side was our teams were handpicked. Uh -huh. And if you didn't play that political game, you wouldn't be handpicked at the end. Mm -hmm. And so when I made the USA national team, everything kind of became more pressure and higher intensity. Mm -hmm. And the national team required not a diet, but a look that required a diet. And gotcha. 
they didn't provide the nutritionist or anything. So I went on very strict diets just on my own yeah. that were very unhealthy. Yeah. Yeah. I hear right now, so my daughter is a cheerleader. Um, yes. Not competitive. Yeah. Just strictly school. Um, but I hear of other cheerleaders, like in college levels, that they have to weigh. Oh, yeah. Once a week, which yeah. in my opinion, that is not what we're going for in this <laughs> no. day and age. No. You do not do that to kids, young adults. You just don't do that. Absolutely mm -hmm. not. We mm -hmm. were, I don't want to say lucky because there were so many things going on. Um, but we were fortunate enough within the diet realm that we didn't have to do weigh-ins. However, looking back on it, just from like my perspective now, I almost wish there was something more tangible like that that we could have done. So that a coach could have said, okay, you're this and I want you here. Mm -hmm. It still is very unhealthy and it still is something I do not agree with. But back then, all I had was this, this idea in my head that they wanted me skinnier. Right. Yeah. Like always. And always. Yeah. And it was never enough. And mm -hmm. there was never that finish line that I could get to. It was just always get more, always get more. Mm -hmm. And because there weren't any resources that were... Um, offered to us because we were so young. I think mm -hmm. it was assumed, oh, they just don't need it. I had to kind of figure things out on my own. And I internalized that and turned that into unhealthy eating disorders and, mm -hmm. and everything. But I, I do think it's skewing now because girls have been so open and there's been yeah. so much come to light that they're now offering psychologists as they should and therapists mm -hmm. and nutritionists and anything that they could possibly need, which is mm -hmm. really good. How did you do <laughs> transitioning from a strict diet mm -hmm. and from that training? How did you transition <laughs> after? Uh, I describe it as running full speed into a brick wall. Gotcha. It was the hardest transition of my life because for 16 years of my life, I every decision I made on a daily basis was um, catered to gymnastics. It was mm -hmm. catered to my goals and my aspirations and the finish line of the Olympics and what what visually I wanted to be and everything who I hung out with. And when I finished with that and I quote unquote retired, transitioning to be a normal person who wasn't training mm -hmm. to have an Olympic medal in gymnastics, mm -hmm. I didn't know how to operate. I didn't know what to do at 4 p.m. every day because I truly had never been outside of a gymnastics gym at mm -hmm. 4 p.m. Um, I remember driving down the street on Monday at 4 p.m. and I was like, wait, I don't know what, I don't know where to go. <laughs> like, I don't know what to do. I didn't know how to work out unless it was in a gymnastics gym with a coach. I didn't know how to eat because that whole part of my being was gone. And it took me many, many years. I remember I, I went two years just kind of aimlessly wandering around the world trying to figure out what to do before I was like, you know what? I need to go back to gymnastics because I feel too lost. It was mm -hmm. the only thing I felt comfortable with. I tried to make the 2012 team. I competed for two years and made it to Olympic trials and mm -hmm. just knew that it wasn't for me, so retired right before Olympic trials and went on another two-year journey trying to figure it out. But it, it was very hard. There's mm -hmm. an identity that you lose that you have to kind of rebuild. Yeah. Well, in mm -hmm. 2012, when you decided not to go for the Olympics again, that was kind of like your, like, what I would say, Simone Biles moment, uh -huh. right? Like, not yeah. as public, but yeah. you, like, chose yourself over the sport. Yeah. And when she did that, I thought it was just, like, so cool that so many young women saw that. What, what were your thoughts on oh that? Oh, my gosh. I have so many thoughts on that. <laughs> I thought it was a historic moment. I know there are a lot of opinions in the, t like in the moment of, of her choosing to step down. I remember even hearing people around me and friends around me be like, oh, she's representing the United States. She just needs to, like, just mm -hmm. a few more days. She's representing us. Like, yeah. They saw it almost as a failure, where I saw it as truly a stamp in history and time. There has been so many things come to light about USA Gymnastics mm -hmm. and how corrupt it has been for so many decades and even longer. I think for so long, every single gymnast within that sport never had a voice. They had zero control over anything mm -hmm. that pertained to them, their bodies, their voice, their health. And... For Simone Biles, the greatest literally of all time, mm -hmm. and I have said this a million times, I don't think anybody will ever touch her. I, yeah. I've never seen that kind of talent and separation in, in a sport period, let alone gymnastics. And to see her show up on the stage and say, you know what, 
I'm going to make a stand and I'm going to do this for me because it's what's yeah. in my best interest, I think paves a way for every single little girl in that sport from here forward. Mm -hmm. She truly empowered them to be able to say, I don't care what age you are or to what level, you get to control yeah. your your choices mm -hmm. and yourself. Yeah. So I'll tell you, it, in, it's all little girls. Mm -hmm. And I got permission from my tailor. So I mm -hmm. have a 16-year-old tailor. <laughs> She's been dancing since she was three years old. Um, she is, she has a lot of issues, autoimmune issues, mm -hmm. type one diabetic, alopecia, rheumatoid arthritis. So the past couple of years has really been a struggle for mm -hmm. her. Um, last year she couldn't go to dance nationals because she hurt herself mm -hmm. and she had a back injury and it was, it was a big ordeal. Mm -hmm. So this year, she decided to, to dance again and try it out one last time. Mm -hmm. And she was stressed. And I had to come get her from school. She was having a panic attack. And I'm like, what is wrong? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, not everybody's blessed with this, but she made her first B. <laughs> you know, <laughs> she's That's a sophomore great. in high school. And she was like, Mom, I'm dancing four hours a night. I, I, I don't know if I can do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, you know, do not look at me and your father. Mm -hmm. And we have no, uh, this is your, mm -hmm. your issue. This is not our opinion. You do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And she cried. And she, I mean, on a very minor level, like you, um, not like you, yours was major. <laughs> Um, she was like, but I'm a dancer. That's what everybody knows me. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm going to lose my identity at, at that. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, your, your mental health is more important. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, do you want to dance after school? And mm -hmm. she's like, no, not mm -hmm. in college. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, if you stay in dance, you need to come down from these AP courses. Is that worth, worth it for you? She was like, no, I want to go to these Ivy League schools. I want to be a doctor. And I'm like, well, there's your answer. Mm -hmm. And she stepped down, and it was hard. And I commend Simone for letting these girls know that it's mm -hmm. okay. It's okay to step down. Mm -hmm. You know, your mental health. Her poor little body, she was hurt all the time. Mm -hmm. All the time. Well, yeah. and I've, I've talked to a lot of college kids. I used to do, like, seminars with college kids across the country. And we used to talk about this a lot, that a lot of times as a kid, and I, I put college kids as kids, mm -hmm. um, we put them in, in this bucket that as adults we know better. We know that if they just stick to it, they can become the lawyer. If they just stick to it, they can make the Olympics. If mm -hmm. they just push through... They can become that famous pianist or whatever it might be. And we, we would always talk to these college kids and say, you're probably on a path right now that someone put you on. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, as a kid, you actually have more control and more knowledge about what it is you want to do in life than anybody around you. Yeah. And there were so many times in my career that I felt pressured um, to become something and I would, I would go home to my mom and dad. I'd be like, I'm done. I mm -hmm. don't want to do gymnastics anymore. I feel too much pressure. I feel like you guys, I feel like my, my coaches are expecting me to do what X, Y, and Z. And my parents would just kind of chuckle. And they'd be like, honey, you don't need to, like, I understand the challenge. But they said, you don't have to do gymnastics. We can quit tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. My mom would even be like, I hope you quit because we can go shopping I was and I can say. get my daughter back. Yeah. Um, I get to go on vacation earlier there are now. Many, <laughs> there are many times where my mom was like, do you want to play hooky today? <laughs> like we don't have to go to gymnastics. And I just think as kids, you have to reiterate over and over and over again that there are so many different things you can do out there. Mm -hmm. And just because you're good at something doesn't mean you should do it. Right. It's right. almost like the opposite. Right. Yeah. And I'm, I'm so incredibly proud of her because Number one, I mean, I'm just going to throw it out there. I was not a studious person. I, my mom, who's sitting up front, look at her. She's giggling. She, she says, I graduated in Phi Mu. I mean, yeah. it is what it is. And I did. But I commend her so much for knowing, mm -hmm. at 16 years old, I want to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. I really want to go to Duke. But I can't do it while 
mm-hmm. dancing four hours a night. Yeah. That's, it's, that it's is incredible. really, that is really incredible. incredible. Yeah. Good for her. Yeah. How do you think you'll like raise no, my God. your kids? <laughs> if they want um, to, like if, if Drew wants to do gymnastics or Jet wants to play um, football. Oh Andrew and I talk about this a lot. First, I still don't know how I have children, like how <laughs> the world allows me to have kids. Like I still feel like a child myself. I remember leaving the hospital and I was like, you mean I can take Yeah, we all felt like this is that. real. <laughs> like, are you sure? I think we all were Do like, you know wait, me? they come home with <laughs> yeah. us now? Who's, Do you all come home with Do you with send me? someone yeah. with me? Yeah. So I'm still working through that. Yeah. Um, but my husband and I have talked about this a lot because we have a lot of fears around football and gymnastics with our son mm-hmm. and our daughter because I feel like the world will not allow them to be anything less than great in those sports. Mm-hmm. Yes. I, I can already hear, you know, gymnastics coaches being like, oh, it's Sean Johnson's daughter. She yeah. has to be good. And I am a firm believer that, especially as a parent, you have to allow your child to fail Mm -hmm. and fail miserably because it's the only way you learn. Mm -hmm. Um, That was a huge thing that my coach taught me is that the only way you can learn success is by falling and falling flat on your face a million times. The most humbling sport in the world is gymnastics because Mm -hmm. you split a beam, you fall on your face, you fall, you know, Mm -hmm. a million times over before you ever learn a skill correctly. And I think that's beautiful for kids. And to have the idea that like my daughter will walk in the gym and a coach will expect her to be good yes. as a toddler, it freaks me out. Yeah. Um, that being said, Andrew and I have agreed that like our kids will put them in everything that we can possibly find. And if they end up choosing football and gymnastics, Lord help us. <laughs> um, but we will sit in the stands and be the the best cheerleaders for them. Yeah. And, staple our mouths shut so you would (laughs) never coach never really no why um I have a lot of friends in the sport that had that father-daughter or mother-daughter relationship within they were also coach and they were Mm -hmm. they were mom and it worked for some people but I think for the most part it was a very it was a struggle to kind of Mm -hmm. especially at that adolescent age within gymnastics Mm -hmm. to find that boundary I think kids should be able to come home to mom and dad. And I think it's also very hard for an adult to find that separation. Yeah. And I just don't think I'm capable. That's a lot of together time. It is. And I want to be able to have my kid (laughs) vent to me about how coach was being a, you know, turd that day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, For lack of a better word. I I do. I just, I want to, I don't think I have that ability to do both. And I want to stay mom. Yeah. I love that. That's, That's awesome. I know. I, I giggle. I look at mom, but I don't think I could be with you 24-7. <laughs> yeah. As much as I love you, mama. Yeah. <laughs> I, I will say, though, I have had my brain go down that route of, like, Drew chooses gymnastics. And I would, my coach, Coach Chow, who is it, my second dad, I truly believe he is the best coach in the world. And he now coaches the Chinese national team. Oh, and I've already told them, I'm like, if my daughter chooses gymnastics, you have to come home. Yes. <sighs> you're like, you, you're you the only be. person that yeah. can coach her. <laughs> well, because you yeah. had such like a balance, it seems yeah. like, which is rare, in the, especially when you go to the Olympics. But, yeah. um, well, let's talk about what you're doing now. Okay. We know that, you know, you're an Olympian and you will always <laughs> be, but you've moved on to amazing things too. You guys Thanks. have a podcast. We do. Couples things. Yes. Okay. I was um, watching some last night, and I was like, this is so cute. And yes. you got nominated for a People's Choice Award, right? We did. That's we did. Awesome. We did not win, but we got nominated. But that, hey, that's <laughs> awesome. Can we'll we win. talk about your we'll outfit try to win next that year. night? Thank you. You look <laughs> stunning. Thank you. Yeah. You always look stunning, but oh, that you. was perfect. Thank yeah. you so much. That was, yeah. I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> so really good. Someone told me to wear this, and I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah. I'll do it. Yeah. Um, so tell us what it's about a little bit, just for anyone who hasn't. So it's called Couple Things, and it's all about couples and the things they do. My husband and I are very, very open and transparent about our marriage, and that marriage is hard, and relationships are hard. And we got really, really tired of society and Hollywood painting these pictures that um, relationships are easy, and that if they aren't easy, you need to leave. Um, and there are definitely reasons that you should leave. I obviously. Um, but we got really tired of that because we love marriage and we love families. And 
there was just a doomsday picture painted on family and we really didn't enjoy that. And so we thought, why not start a podcast and interview families and couples about how they do it? And it's been really eye-opening that every single couple does it a different way Mm -hmm. and figures out how to make it work. And I think it's really um, a beautiful thing to kind of show the world. Yeah. Yeah, Marriage is, um, I mean, (laughs) John and I will be married 20 years in February. Yes. I have no clue. Yeah, I mean, I know how we did it. I mean, yes. we're a very great couple. I mean, yes. and I'll be the first to tell you that I went to counseling oh, at yes. some point. And I mean, it's tough. Yes, it's tough. and it is, and it should be. Mm-hmm. And even like, we just could go on a tangent about that. But I remember reading magazine after magazine, and it would be like 10 tips to finding the one. And it would paint this picture of, you're going to know someday who the perfect person is. Mm -hmm. And if it is the perfect person, it'll be the perfect relationship. Mm -hmm. And you'll never argue. And you'll have this fairy tale wedding and the fairy tale ending. And if you do argue, it's probably the wrong person. So you just made the wrong choice and you should just leave and go find the one. And Mm -hmm. we just hate that. I just hate that. Did you, when you met him, did you think he was the one? I personally have never believed in the one. Really? Mm -hmm. My mom and dad are, um, taught me not to believe in that because they said, if you try to look for the perfect person, then yeah. you'll never find someone because yeah. you can always find flaws in people. Mm-hmm. And I remember meeting Andrew and thinking right away, like, I could marry this man. Mm-hmm. But I knew that I could probably feel that about different people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I agree. I don't think there's just one. I think you can. Uh, yeah. I called it. my mom after our first <gasps> Applebee's date. <laughs> <laughs> I called her. I That's said, Mama, amazing. I met him. I met the man I'm going to marry. Aww. That was after our first date. Let me tell y'all a little cute little story. So my mom's from New Zealand. And my dad was in the Navy. And they were in Sydney, Australia. And she was working abroad. And um, my dad was on leave. He was about to come back from, um, he was about to come back to the States they met, knew each other for three days. Oh, my gosh. Talk about finding <laughs> the incredible. one. That's incredible. That's incredible. Knew each other for three days. My dad left, sent her a plane ticket. She came, and she got married within a month. That's oh amazing. So it? I will say, though, like, that's an incredible story. And mm-hmm. I do believe in, like, the one in that aspect. I just believe that there are probably multiple people out there that you could spend your whole life with mm-hmm. and make it work. Yes. yes. I don't think there's literally just one. Mm-hmm. Yes. Otherwise, yeah. people I'm, will get lost looking. Yes. I agree. I yeah. agree with that. I know. But I think you do now. You have a hunch. For sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, let's talk about the two of you for a second. Y'all are completely opposite. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. So Mallory, Mallory Irvin told yes. me, because they're best friends. <laughs> You're actually quite shy. Very. And we all know Andrew is not. No. How do no, you do no. that? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I think I needed someone like him, though, because I, I am very shy. I'm very reserved. Um, crowds make me very nervous. Or like, <laughs> make me very nervous. I don't usually like sharing my life, so Lord knows how I got on the stage. Um, but... My husband has kind of worked at that, and not intentionally, but just seeing how confident and how extroverted and how just full of life he is, I'm so envious of it, and I have been since day one. It's something that I think I find very, very attractive, mm-hmm. and he's really challenged me over the years to kind of slowly get out of my bubble and be like, you, sh- you don't have to be nervous. You can have conversations. You can kind of get out of there, but... Yeah. Um, yeah, it was a struggle at first. We would yeah. have, like, arguments because he'd be like, why are you so quiet at this function? It's my friends. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I'm like, I'm sweating the whole time. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. He's so outgoing. Uh, really. Yeah. But that takes so much confidence. Like, I don't know, to just walk in a room and be like, this is who I am. Take it or leave it. I still have yet to, like, believe that there is any ounce of self like doubt or yeah. insecurity in my husband, which is so beautiful. Yeah. It is so coming from gymnastics, I think, where it was such a critical sport where we were taught to literally judge ourselves. Um, he is just the opposite. Yeah. And I, I hope our kids get a hundred percent of that. How did you fall into the TikTok um, <laughs> YouTube world? Because it's, I mean, you guys are absolutely hilarious. You make like the coolest content, but what 
I don't know, like, what were the steps to get to that point of, like, okay, this is what we're going to do now? Um, my husband. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was all my husband. So I was in sports marketing for years. So I made the USA national team when I was 12 and had to hire an agent and a professional, like, public, like publicity team. Where from then on, I got to work with incredible companies like Coca-Cola and McDonald's and Nike and represent as like a sports ambassador. But from the time I was 12, I was taught um, within these partnerships what to wear, how to look, Mm -hmm. how to talk, how to be politically correct, how to kind of live within a box that was acceptable with the world. Mm -hmm. And I learned how to kind of be a different person for so many years. And so when I met my husband... um, he saw that I was almost bipolar. I would literally go to an event and I would become a different person. And he'd be like, what is this? Mm -hmm. Like, stop putting on a front for people. And I was like, well, that front is what I've been taught to do. And so he was bouncing around the NFL at the time and he started a YouTube channel. Don't know why. Just for the heck of it. Because he's Andrew. If you met his dad, it would make sense. His dad (laughs) films literally everything. Everything, everything, everything. He has everything. I mean... He could find at any second the, like, you're like, I need to see Andrew at two years, five days, and one minute <laughs> walking down the stairs. It, he, like, he has yes. everything archived. And so my husband naturally filmed everything. So he was filming all of his bounce arounds with the NFL and started a YouTube channel. And he's like, babe, we got to do this. And I was like, absolutely not. <laughs> I'm not going to post videos of myself, whatever. Um, fast forward, it got to be a love-hate relationship and now a passion of mine because instead of having the world tell me who I was allowed to be, we actually got to show things from our perspective uh-huh. and we got to edit them and actually tell the real story. Mm-hmm. And we, we kind of did both sports marketing and social media for about two years before I quit every job that I had and we do it full time, which is crazy. He even quit the NFL to do it basically. I love it. I love it. I enjoy it. I enjoy it a lot. A lot. <laughs> yes. It's a lot of fun. It's it really is. fun. It looks like you guys have a It's blast. a challenge, but yeah. <laughs> it is 100% my husband. Yeah. Yeah. His ideas. And People stuff. walk up and they're like, I love your TikTok. I'm like, my husband runs our TikTok. <laughs> it's every, it's all of his ideas. He edits it. He's like, babe, I have an idea for a video. I'm like, what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> So how do you guys sort of balance working together, having the kids? Is it totally 50-50, like you have two, so it's just like man-to-man It is 100% man-to-man, 50-50. We spend every waking second together with our babies, working, and being mom and dad. So it's who do you got today, Mm -hmm. pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I mean, we we know how busy you are. (laughs) And um, just being here today, it just, it means the world to us. Oh, thank it you. It truly does. It was truly an honor. Oh, when you guys asked, I was like, yes, this is fun. Oh, you're so, so sweet. You have such a great story. I'm did, more excited. Before we, before we end this, how did you like being the, um, the 12th well, man? Type. I was so nervous. <laughs> Were you? I, I pictured myself tripping, running onto the field. <laughs> I uh, pictured myself dropping the sword and like impaling <laughs> well, myself. Well, the sword was about or, your size. Yeah, <laughs> and then so big. and then standing back there with all the players, I was like, <laughs> I feel really awkward. <laughs> I was like, you guys go do your thing. I'm sorry, I don't know why I'm here. Oh I was so. It was so cool though. It was so. I cool. was so sad to miss that game. You look so cute though. Oh, thank all the you. Pictures are good. <laughs> okay, you. so where like what's the best place for people to find you? I know because you also do a toy store, like an online we did shop. We have a toy store. I just found that, and I was like, yeah. Oh, shop here so we have a toy store called teddy and bear it was just a little passion project my husband and i did for our kids and now we like sell toys somehow but you can find us literally on all platforms under the east family or sean johnson or andrew east so east family okay yeah tiktok youtube instagram yeah. all the things <laughs> all of it podcast <laughs> podcast yes yes oh my gosh well we're excited to see what you well, do next and you. support you yes. but thank we you. appreciate you and we appreciate all of you absolutely listening to Out of Bounds with Jamie and Abby live. This was a new thing for us. This is I cool. feel like we need some of the training she got, like in her <laughs> <laughs> with, uh, with our outfits. We, we need with all everything. <laughs> no. No. I need outfit help. <laughs> I've got your girl. She changed my life. Awesome. <laughs> yes. I mean, this is like super cute. But your cute. outfit's amazing. I love Thanks. it. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> now it's just going to be girls. Like, no, I love your outfit. I love yours. Yeah.
<laughs> okay, oh. but thank you guys. Thank y'all. Yes. <laughs>